everyone for joining us. A few, a f we still have a few attendees streaming in, so so we'll begin because we we want to make sure we we're on time. Thank you so much for joining us, especially for this evening masterclass. Thank you, thank you for, very much for everyone coming in from Geneva. We've also got a colleague we've met earlier, Karsten from The Hague. Um, also some colleagues dialing in from other duty stations, also New York and also networks from the University of Geneva. So thank you for coming. If you're if you're new to us, send us uh, a hi in the chat, uh, explaining where you're from. We, we, we love to hear where you're from. For those who are new to the comments, welcome, welcome to the comments space. Um, a very brief introduction to the comments for those who are new to it. So my name is Natalie. I work at the UN Geneva Library and Archives for the Knowledge and Learning Commons. And this is our space, which has been designed by the library and our Center for Learning and, Learning and Multilingualism to be able to bring about spaces for collaboration, um, informal learning and knowledge sharing. And it's specifically designed also for UN staff, diplomats and interns. Um, but of course, our sessions are widening to new attendees and audiences, depending on the partners we're working with. And for tonight's session, we're really happy to be able to have as our collaborator, Professor Raphael H. Cohen from the University of Geneva. So thank you very much to Professor Cohen for, for joining us and taking the time out of his busy schedule. We also want to just explain that over the past few months, we have been sharing these online sessions due to the situation with COVID-19. But actually, it's been a really positive experience for us to be able to be flexible, to try and be creative in how we continue to try and share knowledge together, especially from different departments and across our different areas of knowledge. So I guess that's a very good spirit for us to keep as we look at tonight's session, which you can see on the screen. It's new paradigms for managing teams. So the levers to maximize team engagement in the public sector. Now, I will just now share with you a little bit more about Raphael Cohen as our speaker tonight. He is a self-professed serial entrepreneur. I'm sure he'll explain a little bit more about that in the session if you have any questions on that. He's a professor, an advisor, a mentor to many people, the author of two best-selling books, one on leveraging opportunities to, to bring about successful projects and business projects, and the other on maximizing uh, team engagement. So levers to maximize team engagement, which is the subject of, of tonight's session. As you can see on the screen, he's also the academic director of the Entrepreneurial Leadership Specialization at the University of Geneva Executive MBA. And a lot of his professorial teaching is focused on innovation, professional agility, and evolving our idea of leadership, so fair and caring leadership. And we hope that this will be a useful session for you because as we move through this time of COVID-19 together, and of course other challenges and changes in the world and also the world of work, um, these ideas of innovation, agility, new ways of leading and managing, also compassion and empathy in leadership. This is not new, it's it's rising in all around us and it and it does require us also as, as a lot of us working at the UN and in multilateral environments to address these critical themes and, and to be able to build on them together. So for tonight's session, we're looking at this idea of how to best engage teams in new ways and maybe even not in traditional ways of how you see leaders and managers. And you may have questions on this. I know I do. So what does leadership mean? What does management mean? What do we expect from our leaders? Um, working as a team also in the library where I am at the Commons, how do we best engage our teams, especially as we're more flexible in terms of technology now? Um, what, what does it mean leadership at all levels, especially if we see it, leadership as a behavior, not just necessarily a position at the at the top of an organization. The, if you have any questions throughout the session, you're more than you're more than welcome to to ask them. Um, and these are the learning objectives that we've come up with with Raphael. This is what Raphael would like to to share with you tonight. It's to be able to understand what people expect from leadership at all levels, to be aware of managerial approaches that might weaken our capacity to lead and to be able to engage our teams and also to discover some of the benefits of deploying engaged team chatters. And he's going to explain uh, what that means. So, so hold tight. Um, there'll also be time to, to ask and to interact with Professor Cohen during the Q&A session. So around 6 p.m. Geneva time, we'll, we'll head on over for about 30 minutes of interaction. So please feel free to ask your questions. You can ask them either in written form in the chat don't forget to press all participants so that we can see uh, your questions together or if you prefer to ask it verbally 
uh, feel free to. You can do so by clicking on participants at the button at the bottom of your screen normally, and then press a raise hand, and, and we'll hopefully get to all of your questions. So just a reminder to please uh, mute your microphone if you're not speaking, and as, uh, also a reminder that the session is recorded. We do understand if you would prefer not to be visually shown in a recording, so just make sure you turn off your video um, if you would prefer not to be part of the recording. Thank you for that. Great. So before we launch into the presentation tonight, we do have a few reflections from the New Work Perspective by our colleague, Thomas Neufing. He's the chief of the Center for Learning and Multilingualism at UN Geneva. And for those who aren't aware, New Work is our initiative at the UN, which is very staff driven, that aims to evolve our work culture together as part of the UN system. So a few reflections, firstly, from Thomas, just on the linkages and um, the capacities to think about what this means for the UN perspective. Thank you, Thomas, over to you. Thank you very much, Natalie, and uh, hello to everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are connected to the session. Uh, and I'm particularly fo looking forward to, to Professor Cohen uh, talking to us tonight. And maybe I will not speak for too long, just maybe share a few reflections, as you said, from our work angle, maybe to just brief you a little bit on what work is about and how it came about, and also how it is linked to the topic that we discussed tonight. It was about two years ago, uh, 2017, early 2018, we received the first uh, staff engagement survey results that the Secretariat undertook. At the same time, as you know, in Geneva, we are in the middle of our strategic heritage plan. We invest almost $100 million in our physical infrastructure. So those two events uh, coincided and made us at the UN Geneva think how we can also use this opportunity to not only to have maybe a new architecture and refurbished building, uh, but also how we can design also on the campus uh, and also with the findings of the staff engagement survey, um, how we can use this opportunity to maybe inject um, oxygen into the organization because everybody recognized the staff engagement survey, but also us in the organization collected maybe a bit of dust, you know, that also around us, there are some practices, you know, that, uh, just mentioned agile, you know, which is uh, uh, practiced in the private sector, uh, where we thought, you know, we, we should also modernize the way we are working. Um, but uh, we thought we should organize a staff initiative, we should start ask uh, staff at large, and all our colleagues to come forward with ideas, maybe also with areas where we could do better, but also then to come with proposals uh, on, on how to do things. So now in the second or third year, uh, we have initiated a number of activities around innovation, around working flexibly, uh, and uh, also you know, to um, um, train managers on how to manage virtual teams uh, or semi virtual teams that was before COVID. And then, of course, COVID happened. Uh, and um, fortunately, we were pretty well prepared, you know, because, uh, because of new work, we already reflected on how we could uh, modernize the way we work. Uh, and uh, when then the crisis hit, we realized that we were actually pretty well prepared because we undertook a lot of initiatives that helped us. Um, now, in terms of the topic of... I'm sorry, Thomas, to, to interrupt you. You, you. You're cutting out a little bit. Do you mind just to, to stay as close to the screen as possible? That might help. Thank you. Sure. Okay. And you interrupt me if the audio is not good enough. Um, so in terms of the topic, new paradigm for managing teams, um, I also, or we as new work or we as colleagues, we, we couldn't agree more that we are experiencing a paradigm shift. And we, of course, very, very much looking forward to hearing Cohen more about it. But also at the UN, uh, I think we're in the middle of going through a paradigm shift um, where the role of the manager, leader, supervisor, undergoing a fundamental change. Um, as you know, our organization is very much command and control, very hierarchical. Our grading system is built on the, the British military, uh, the P4, P5, D1s, etc. They all modeled uh, around that. Uh, and that has been our organizational culture for, for a number of decades. And we also collectively realized that this is no longer effective, uh, but also um, it's, a, it's a culture change that is difficult, you know, to, to 
to undergo. Uh, the pressure, especially from Generation Y in the workforce, is also uh, uh, moving in that direction and putting also pressure on, on uh, more experienced uh, managers and leaders that we have in, among our ranks. Um, but also, again, we experienced through COVID that the more teams are self-managed and agile, empowered, you know, there are different tags around this, and uh, I'm sure we can talk about uh, you know, these different levels more, but labeled, um, are better prepared to deal with situations uh, and to go uh, through a crisis like we have at COVID. You know, we, we know that this uh, more empowered staff Everybody's also asking for more autonomy. So if you as a leader make sure that hierarchies are flattened, you know, that you empower your colleagues and your team to, to essentially perform, it's, it's the way to go. Uh, however, we know that this is not yet the organizational culture that we have, but we are on the way there. We have about, in the secretariat alone, our middle management is about 55,000 P4s and P5s. You know, that's what, how we define our middle management. So it's a, it's a big number. They actually the sandwiched ones, you know, supervise large number of, of staff, but at the same time uh, also receive the budget pressures from the top. Uh, and I think this is now a group, uh, a segment of our uh, leadership or management level that we want to particularly focus on because you know we want to also empower them. Um, I don't want to talk too much more, but I'm very excited to to discuss this topic uh, together with all of us and uh, look forward also to the presentation but also to the q a afterwards thank you very much go back to you natalie thanks a lot thomas thanks for joining us if you'd like to know more about new work and it's it's new to you i'm sure most of you know it already by now we do have the url on the screen just in case but thank you all for waiting um over to you now professor cohen just a reminder that there were only two requirements uh, from Professor Cohen in the invitation to join tonight's session. One was to have an open mind and one was to have a good sense of humor. So I guess we're gonna find out what this means now. Thank you so much, Professor Cohen, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, and um, with all the questions you have raised at the beginning of this uh, session, I must say that uh, we should stay for much more time than that. 6.30 as scheduled, but so we'll have to, to skip some of the questions. Um, I, uh, there, there are two things I'd like to add to what uh, you have mentioned about me is that I have been teaching how to become agile for the last uh, 15 years. And in fact, I have a, a training program called Agility Booster. Uh, that's really my motto and uh, what I'm, I want people to, to learn. Um, and the, the other thing that uh, Thomas said is that there are, uh, there's a paradigm shift in uh, the UN, but I can tell you this paradigm shift is happening everywhere. And um, I think the private sector has the same issues. I don't know to what extent which one is better or worse, but uh, it, the issues that we're talking about are definitely uh, very similar. Um, in the presentation I have, um, uh, so in the invitations, we said that there are about 65% uh, of employees who would rather uh, change their boss than have a pay increase. Um, that gives a pretty good idea uh, of the how dramatic the situation is. Um, I'm going to share with you another statistic from the same study now is that uh, three out of four employees report that their boss is the worst and most stressful part of their job. Um, that's not very um, glorifying for management. Uh, now, let's see at what uh, subordinates are complaining about. Uh, first, they don't like abuse of authority or abuse of power. They complain about lack, lack of consideration or even contempt. They complain about unjustified vexations. Uh, they complain about disrespectful comments, uh, belittling the work done or efforts made, not honoring commitments, double bind injunctions, lack of courage, lack of exemplarity, and many more. So um, I know all these things don't happen in your organization. This is in the others. 
but I'm sure you heard uh, people talking about uh, these challenges. And in fact, when I go and take a public transportation or in a restaurant and I happen to listen what people are talking about, in most cases, they're talking about uh, how miserable they are at work. So I think we have a, a serious problem and um, that's why issues that are currently in the air are burnout uh, we all know what burnout is. Brownout is when people do things that don't make don't make sense to them. It's a meaningless job, and bore out when they're truly bored. So um, I'm going to show you a, a few uh, illustrations. So I'm not totally politically correct. So I hope you will forgive me. Um, and I'm going to tell you that one of the issues that justify what we have seen so far is the presence of assholes. There are many, way too many assholes. They're not only assholes, there are people who are awkward, etc. But assholes are one of the challenges and I allow myself to talk about assholes because it's the title of a book called The No Asshole Rule. And uh, I love the book for two reasons. The first one is because it's the title of a book that has been um, on the bestseller list for more than six months on, for, at the New York Times. And this book has also even received the prize of the best business book in um, 2007, when I think it was published. So that allows me to use the terminology. So I hope I'm not offending anybody. Um, and the second reason why I love this book, the first one is because of I can use the terminology. And the second one is because it's a book that you can give as a gift. So um, first rule is get rid of these people. And I'll share with you a quote that I think is interesting because um, the, 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 some people are assholes, but you can change. So the real bad news is to continue remaining an asshole when, you, when people have been aware of it. So uh, let's go back to, let's rewind and let's go back to some basics. The first one is that the team achieves more than single people. So it's all about teamwork. The second fundamental is that there are two views of people. One is called theory X and the other one is theory Y. And this has been developed by uh, Mr. McGregor. And what is, what is theory X? Theory X assumes that people don't want to work, that they're lazy, and that they have to be forced to work uh, because they don't have the desire to work. Theory Y assumes that people do want to work and that they even can enjoy doing it. So if anybody is on Theory X, please leave this session because I'm a totally uh, Theory Y oriented. Now, I want to ask you a question. Um, and you, you, you will raise your hand just to answer because there are too many people. Um, assuming you have two banks, okay, and you have to decide in which bank you want to put your money in. So uh, there is one that is relationship driven and uh, one that is fair outcome driven. Now I'm going to explain the difference between the two. So let's say the green and the red, and the, the, sorry, the red and the green. Um, in the relationship driven, people are appointed by who they know. In outcome driven, it's by skills, not only technical skills, but also uh, interpersonal skills. How people are, uh, so what is important in relationship driven, it's the loyalty to the people who have appointed them. Uh, for fair outcome is to deliver fair results. The foundation of authority in relationship driven is power and position. I'm the boss, so I tell you what to do. In fair outcome driven, uh, the authority comes from generating engagement from the, the employees. In the relationship driven, Accountability is minimal. People do just the minimum that they have to do. And while in the fair outcome driven, uh, everything has to be fair because it's fair outcome driven. So it's fairness based. 
And if somebody has a problem with the manager, uh, what recourse do people have? What employees, uh, what recourses employees have? Um, in the relationship driven, it's they can only do something about it uh, to go to whistleblowing uh, organization only if there's a major transgression. In the fair based, things are worked out because everything has to be fair based. Now, the result of what is happening in the two organization is that the level of engagement in the relationship driven is actually minimal because people do the minimum they have to do not to get fired. Uh, while in the fair outcome driven, they are committed to deliver the best because they're engaged. And the impact on the performance, of course, is different. One is performance based, uh, um, uh, but the minimum. And the other one is uh, maximum performance. So uh, I'd like you to tell me, uh, I can, unfortunately cannot see you while I'm uh, sharing my screen, but um, who would like to deposit his or her money in the uh, relationship driven? So maybe Nadia, you, you can, uh, you, Natalie, you can tell me because I don't see people on, on my screen. Sure. If we would like to have some results via um, hand raising, um, just click on participants on participants and you can select to raise your hands. I believe there in the chat. We do have a question actually coming in from Alejandro. Yeah. Who defines what's fair in organizations? Why would employees be motivated to produce fair outcomes? Maybe something you might want to answer. Um, yes, yes. I'll, I was planning to talk about this later, but sure. I'll mention it quickly now. Uh, fairness is very subjective. And um, it's, uh, it's uh, the application of, uh, sorry, fairness is to take into account a, a proper balance of interests of the different uh, stakeholders and um, to decide what is fair and what is not fair, nobody can make that decision on his or, or her own. It, it has to be something that needs to be debated. And at one point, uh, people make a choice. So in a democracy, uh, what is considered fair is what the majority wants. That's how um, I would simp oversimplify. Um, but you must have the perception of fairness because if people feel that they're in a non-fair environment, uh, then they automatically are less engaged. So every organization doesn't fit for everybody because everybody does not have the same perception of fairness. Okay. Okay. We do have another another uh, comment on your question from Malta, um, with a with a counter question for you. People who are well connected with people in a relationship-driven organization might want to invest in it. True, but are they the majority? <laughs> so uh, you may have a few people who have the personal relationship, but as a as a neutral person outside, uh, I guess most people would prefer uh, would feel more comfortable in the green organization than in the red one. Um, so, uh, did you have many people voting for the red one? I don't see many many votes on the screen, but that's okay, okay because we do have um, we do have people responding via question. Uh, final final one on on I guess your question there. Where does a cooperative or co-op driven enterprise fall within this model that you have on screen? A cooperative driven enterprise. Okay, uh, I have oversimplified this uh, this the, the, in, in two complete opposite. There are everything in between. But the cooperative could be uh, closer to the green uh, type of organization because people have a voice. It's not uh, who you know. It's more what the collective body uh, wants. Um, so I'm going to focus really on the green type of organization. Now, how do you recognize a leader? Um, Usually when I ask this question, people say it's the one who has charisma, who is the one who is inspiring, etc. Uh, I will simplify by saying it's the one who has engaged followers. Because you could have people with charisma who have nobody following them. Um, you could have people who are very inspirational, but nobody's following them. 
So the, the bottom line is people who are uh, following. So if we admit that this is the key of what leadership is about, then the next question is um, that, that they should be asking is who wants to be led by me? This is provided um, that they, they, they dare ask that question. Uh, and those who don't dare ask this question, they already have a problem. So now let's look at what is leadership. I'm going to give you a definition of leadership, but there are many definitions of leadership. This is the one I like. And why I like it? Because it says leadership is the ability to win the hearts and minds of people to achieve a common purpose. And when we talk about the heart, it's to generate feeling of excitement, challenge, ownership, commitment, and engagement. And the minds, it's to have a clear understanding of what has to be done and how to do it best. So um, there is this emotional component that I think is very often uh, underestimated, and that's why I like this definition. Now, I'm uh, very interested in engagement because that, I, I think, is the key issue. Why? Because engaged employees increase productivity and profits by up to 35%. So um, every organization should focus on boosting performance. And to boost performance, we should boost engagement. Now, what it means is that if you only measure performance, but you don't take into account if it has been produced by engaged people, you never know if you could have a better performance because the people who have delivered the current performance are not engaged. So if you have a certain level of performance and you compare it, sorry, certain level of performance delivered by non-engaged people, if they were engaged, the performance would be higher. And to, to know whether you have the level of engagement, well, you have to measure it. As long as you don't measure the level of engagement, you cannot know if you have the optimal level of performance. So um, there are ways to measure the level of performance. But before that, I want to explain something, is that there are four kinds of, of engagement. The first level of engagement, the first category of engagement is intrinsic motivation. This is very personal. Nobody can do much about it. Everybody has his own, her own level of engagement. Then there are level, the, the engagement for the cause. Like for me, I love teaching. I'm passionate about it. So I'm engaged. I love to teach. Then there is, the engagement for the institution. I work at the University of Geneva. This is a very part-time activity. Most of my job activities are training in organizations, but I, I'm just taking the example of the University of Geneva. I love the institution. It's a very well-known organization, good reputation. It has good standards, treating people quite well. So not much to complain about it. And the fourth kind of engagement is the one that is uh, generated by my manager. So at one point in time, I will not say when, because I don't want to pinpoint to anybody, I had a manager at the University of Geneva who was not very uh, inspiring. I did not like his attitude, etc. So I stopped being engaged. I was doing the minimum. The day that person has, when this person has been replaced, I was totally committed and gang ho uh, again. So what is interesting is that the level of engagement derived from the manager accounts for up to 70% of the total level, level of engagement. So in fact, this is the most important parameter. And we should measure um, uh, the level of engagement that each manager can obtain from his or her team. Now, the problem, when you ask manager if they're good managers, they always say, yeah, of course, uh, I'm good. If you, but this is like a driver in a car. If you take a driver in a car and you, ask, and you ask that driver, are you driving better than the average other drivers? 
most of the people will say, yes, I'm a better driver. But the one who truly knows if the person is a good driver is the passenger. Because the passenger is a lot more lucid. So to know if people, if managers are obtaining engagement, we cannot ask them. We have to ask their teams. So there are uh, ways of doing it. And I'm going to suggest some now in case this is of interest for you. You can ask just a few questions. On a scale of zero to four, to what extent do you, does your manager give you the desire to contribute? To what extent do you recommend your manager to a friend who would like to join the team? To what extent do you want to be led by your manager? So if some of you are interested by this topic, I inform you that there is a free tool that allows to ask these kind of questions. You can actually design your own questions if you don't like these. And the system uh, guarantees total anonymity to the responders, uh, the respondents, because you must have that anonymous answer to get um, uh, meaningful uh, picture. So the way I recommend to use this tool is that the only person who receives the score of engagement is the manager. So each manager receives his or her own score and is the only one to know it. HR doesn't see it, top management doesn't see it, nobody else sees it. Uh, and what we do, we give each manager their score and also the average of other people at the same level. So that way they can have a benchmark. And what we suggest is that after some time, like it could be two years, for instance, um, then the, the future score, not the early ones, the future score could be shared with HR management or uh, maybe everybody. So this gives the opportunity to, the, to each manager to take action. They receive their score at the beginning and they're the only ones to know about it. If they're happy with that score, wonderful. If they're not happy with the score, then it's up to them to decide to do something about it. Nobody will come and point a finger and say, you should do something to improve your leadership skills. It's up to them to decide because they're the only one who know that they don't have the level of engagement they should have. But two years down the road, they will have to face the music. Now, um, there is no single recipe or one size fits all to obtain engagement. So in, in my book, I explained that there are more than 54 levers to obtain engagement. And uh, when I teach it, there are even more. Here you have just a little illustration of what I'm talking about. But in a summary, to obtain engagement, people must do something that has meaning. To obtain engagement, the things should be fair because if people feel that something is not fair, they're not engaged anymore. And the third component is caring. I will explain this in a few minutes. So once people have something that is meaningful or do something that is meaningful, that they think they're treated fairly and that people care about them, or management cares about them, then they're engaged. Without these three ingredients, it's practically impossible to have people fully engaged. And when you have people who are engaged, then you optimize performance. So this shows that fairness on one side and caring are two very important values. And values are important. And I'm going to share now a little cartoon that I like. Of course, not politically correct, but as I said at the beginning, that's the price you have to pay to attend this session. I let you read. So why are values so important? Uh, they're important for everybody, but they're particularly important for the millennials. And I'm sharing with you a statistic that I think is interesting. This study showed that 50% 50, 50 of millennials privilege employers sharing the same values. So for them, 
it's really a criteria for um, recruitment. But even more, 56% would resign if, if they feel that their values are transgressed. My observation, I may be wrong, but this is empirical observation, is that millennials are much more sensitive to uh, values being respected and are more willing to leave a job if they see a transgression. Now, I share another interesting uh, element of uh, coming from another research. 70% of the millennials would change jobs if there is more training for equal salary in another company or under another organization. So why is that? It's because um, they have understood, unfortunately, that organizations are no longer loyal to their employees. They have seen their parents being fired. They have seen their parents uh, losing their jobs, etc. And they say, I can only count on myself. And the only thing I have to do is secure my employability. So I think Training has become a lot more important in organizations than it has ever been. The other thing that people have, that millennials have, and I don't think anybody will contradict me about that, is that they're allergic to hierarchical authority. They're perfectly willing to recognize the authority of somebody they respect, somebody they think treats them well, somebody who is competent, but not only competent, it has to be all of the above, competent, fair, caring, etc. But if somebody comes and says, you do this because I'm your boss, wow, there, this, this is totally unacceptable. So this is to show that um, this is a change of paradigm and uh, we have to adapt and accept it. Now, why is fairness so important? I'm going to show you now a video that um, I think explains it quite well. So, I think you understand that uh, if fairness is so important for uh, chimpanzees, um, it's certainly very important for uh, humans. And Every time I see people going ballistic, going crazy because of something that has happened to them at work, it's usually re related to lack of fairness. And that's why I think fairness is really absolutely central. Unfortunately, there are many situations where people uh, feel uh, unfair treatment. Um, so. People go really crazy. And I think that fairness determines how attractive an organization can be. So it's a prerequisite to feel safe and it's a prerequisite for, for trust. Now, equity, fairness, does not mean equality. So uh, these are two different things. And uh, I will not comment that because I'm very limited in time. I'm trying to cover a lot of territory with you. Uh, I will just share with you this uh, statement. As long as my boss pretends to pay me well, I will pretend to do a good job. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. The second thing that I think is really central is benevolence or caring. And what is caring is a sincere, authentic desire to respect people and act in their interest. So we're not talking about kindness, hugging, stuff like that. We're talking about doing the best in the interest of the other person. And when you talk about this, there's a very simple rule. We, uh, let me show you another video that I think is also quite meaningful. Just Vita. So the 
rule is we receive according to what we give. You give half a cookie, you get half a sports car. So I'm going to go, I'm going very quickly. I apologize for that, but time is really very limited. Uh, why insist so much on fair and caring leadership, the combination of the two, because you can be fair and not caring, and you can be caring and not fair. So the combination of the two that is really important is that it's not possible for a fair and caring leader to discriminate women or any other group. It's not possible to manage by fear. It's not possible to abuse my authority if I'm fair and caring. It's impossible for me to be disrespectful. It's impossible for me not to be honest if I'm fair and caring. It's impossible to lack integrity. Uh, it's impossible to play political games because if I'm fair and caring, I don't try to take advantage. It's of course impossible to act like an asshole. Uh, and I have to walk the talk also. So as you can see, if you have just two basic principles, fairness and caring, um, you change completely people's behavior provided there is a mechanism to enforce it. We'll talk about this uh, a little later. Um, so I'm going now to show you a few tools, sorry, a few tools to implement what I'm talking about. So we're not just in theory. Um, I, I don't have the time to read the chat because it's difficult to talk and read at the same time. But uh, during one of the videos, I, I saw just one comment and the comment said, maybe uh, managers should be elected by employee. And somebody answered, well, there are other tools like um, uh, psychometric tests, etc. Well, let me share with you one piece of information that I was not planning to talk about, but since I saw this comment, I'll share it. Um, there, it has been demonstrated by Italian researchers that the most effective way to appoint managers is by draw. So you put their names in a hat and you draw one and this that gives the best result. So uh, if anybody is interested, I'll be glad to, to share the, uh, the source or the, the reference to this uh, research paper. Everybody laughed when these guys came up with this, but they have demonstrated that it actually works. So food for thought. OK, so first tool I would like to share with you, and this has to do with the question of fairness that we addressed earlier. Um, this is called the team charter. The team charter is you get the whole team together and we discuss six, six components. And that's why I call it the six stage rocket. Uh, the first one is to be clear on what is the purpose of the team. So let me give you a very quick, simple example to illustrate my point. If you, trick, you take a training center, uh, what is the purpose of the training center? And I've done this with many training centers you get the following answers. You say people who say, my job is to provide a catalog of good courses so that people can pick and choose what they need. Other people would say, my job is to help people find the right, right curriculum for their career. And some people say, I'm just giving you three examples, my job is to improve people's employability. And depending on what purpose you have in mind, it will change your behavior, it will change the way you work, it will change a lot of things. So my experience is that very few teams have taken the time to sit down together and agree on what their purpose, their real purpose is. So first thing is to agree on the purpose. And usually if the purpose is parachuted by the manager to the team, it's not the same result as if the whole team agrees that this is the purpose for them. The next step is to measure how uh, or if the purpose is being delivered. In other words, what indicators should be used to verify that the mission purpose is actually happening? Because if you don't measure it, you'll never know if you obtain it. 
if you reach it. So the indicators will clarify the purpose because it's measurable, it's tangible, people understand exactly what has to be delivered because this is what we're measuring. The difference is that the purpose is text and you know, it's just a sentence, sounds good, it looks nice. But the moment you start measuring, then it becomes real. Then the next step is to clarify some of the values or fundamental principles that the team wants to use to govern its own interactions. Then the fourth component is to discuss what are the expected behaviors that the team, that people in the team expect from others, that the team expects from their manager, and that the manager expects from his or her team. So again, this is clarifying how the interaction should work. And I can tell you, uh, the discussion on these topics is really very important. It puts, a, there, there are lots of issues that come out. And again, lack of time prevents me to go into the detail, but if in the question you want to know more, I'll be glad to explain uh, the implication. And then there are some governance rules that explain how certain decisions are made. And for instance, one of them is how, do, how are people promoted? Are they promoted because they have a certain relationship with certain decision makers? Are they promoted because of seniority, how long they've been there? Are they promoted because of their skills or are they promoted because of a draw? So again, the, the many options, but once it's clear, at least everybody knows the rules of the game. So these are the five components of the six stage rocket. And there's a sixth one. And the sixth one has to do with uh, the mechanism for enforcing the charter. Because who needs a team charter that is not respected? And now I'm going to explain what I mean. If you have somebody who is respecting the rules, and if you have somebody else who is not respecting the rules and does not bear any consequence, who is the loser? It's obviously the one who is respecting the rules, okay? There's a parking area where I'm not supposed, I'm not allowed to put my car. Uh, so I will go and put my car somewhere else and have to walk back to the building. Now there's a, this parking spot in front of the, uh, the office and, I, and somebody uses it and does not get a fine, who is the loser? It's me, because I've respected the rule. And the other one got away with it without respecting. So to protect those who are compliant, you must have a mechanism for enforcing the rules. So the discussion with the team is how shall we enforce our team charter? Uh, because if you don't have a mechanism to enforce it, then some people will take advantage. So there is no perfect mechanism. I would just suggest one, but it's one of many. There are others that are possible. Um, it's, a, it's to ask everybody a peer evaluation, so within the team. And um, this another mechanism could be to ask the manager to give his, her opinion on how everybody is complying with the team charter. Personally, I'm not crazy about it, but I prefer this cross measurement where everybody is assessing or giving his or her opinion on uh, the extent that the others are respecting the, the team charter. And again, everybody receives his or her score and is the only one to know about it. Now, if the team wants to share the scores, it's a team decision to share it or not to share it. And it could be the team could say, now we measure, we measure again in six months, again in one year, but in two years, we all put our score on the table and we address the issues. So that's one we're working on, uh, this um, uh, uh, compliance verification uh, or enforcement. And again, the tool that I've mentioned to you, easymirror.com, allows you to do it. It's a freemium. It provides, like a doodle, you can create a 360, a mutual 360, 
where everybody receives only his or her score and nobody else sees it. Or you can also use it for measuring the level of engagement, as I've mentioned earlier. And critical issue, the respondents are totally anonymous. There is absolutely no way to know uh, who said what. Um, the other good thing about this tool is that you can create your own question. You don't like doodle, you don't need to, to be going into a mold of preset questions by somebody. Um, okay, I think that gives you pretty good idea. So the, the sixth component of the uh, team charter is protection measure. What mechanism you put in place to make sure that everybody complies with the uh, team charter? So this is a, a tool that is very effective, very well used. Um, I think it's quite interesting. Um, another tool that I think is important for implementing what we're talking about is feedback, because um, the team charter will give you the foundations of all the rules of the game that have been discussed and that can be revised over time, etc. Um, but it cannot cover everything. So the idea is that by using continuous feedback, you can address the issues as they come. You don't wait three months or six months to tell somebody, I noticed that you are doing this kind of thing and I don't like it. Um, so, uh, by the way, feedback is not only negative, it could also be positive, but I just took this example. So the idea I'm trying to explain is you have the team charter that is the foundations with uh, the core rules. And then, and this is revised and discussed every once in a while. And then on a daily basis, you have continuous feedback. If there is an issue, then uh, we discuss it when it happens. Uh, and if something works well, we also mention it, mention it. So the philosophy I'm trying to explain you is what I have been discussing um, in the advisory board of the French Post. Uh, I'm lucky to be part of a small advisory board. board. We're about six people outside of the French Post and we discuss uh, managerial strategies. And the French Post is 250,000 employees. So it's not a small boat, it's a huge vessel uh, that is not so simple to, to manage. And the, what we've been working on is the following approach, is the organization has some core principles, values, some really fundamentals that have to be respected by everyone. Then within those core principles, each team can create its own team charter. So the core principles are the DNA of the organization, but then each team works differently because you cannot expect in the French post that the mailman has the same culture of, or way of working as the um, post bank. People dealing with money, uh, derivatives, financial derivatives and stuff like that. These are two completely different populations. So instead of trying to have a homogeneous one size fits all for everybody, which is absolutely impossible. I've never seen any organization that has the, uh, the same culture in all its teams. So the idea is we define what is really important for the top management, the other core principles, and they can be discussed with the base, with everybody, but once there's an agreement, this is not negotiable. And then, Below that, each team can design its own team charter and that works extremely well. So the, if we, the, 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 the thinking we had in this advisory board is that what is really important for the management? The important things are first to verify that each manager delivers a good level of performance. This is, this is already being measured anyway. But the second thing we should measure is that each team manager maximizes the level of engagement of his or her team. Because if there is not optimal level of engagement, then the performance will suffer. And we need to know whether the performance is optimal or not, and we cannot know 
without knowing if it has been delivered by people who are engaged or not. And that's what I have explained earlier. And the third thing we should measure is make sure that our core principles are being respected. So I'm not going to develop more this concept, but the idea here is by measuring these three things, we are make sure we obtain what we want at top at, at the uh, top level of management. Why? Because we don't need to get into the how. We just need to make sure that the DNA is respected. This is number three. We need to make sure we obtain performance and we need to make sure that the teams are engaged. Now, how every manager obtains his or her level of engagement is his or her problem. We don't need to get into telling people how they have to work. We just measure the result. So it's a result-oriented way of working rather than prescribing people and telling people how they should be. So that's the approach. Um, I'm not going to show you examples of core principles because I see the time is flying. And um, I would like to um, tell, share with you another interesting tool. It's called uh, Strength Leadership. What is Strength Leadership? It's a workshop where people learn how to identify their skills and their strengths. Interestingly enough, many people don't know uh, how, what are their true skills and, and their strengths. And th there is a mechanism to help people identify them uh, and to learn how to take advantage of, the, of them, to capitalize on their strength. Now, Gallup has been promoting this approach. They have a tool called Strength Finder. This is an online tool. I think it's good, but I think it's not enough. And that's why the strength leadership combines the Gallup uh, component plus other things that um, uh, deliver very spectacular results. So let me give you some statistics on impact of the people who use this strength leadership, because the idea is that instead of checking what are the weaknesses and telling people you're not good at this you should improve it here the approach is oh you're really good at that and let's see how you can use this at best so instead of looking at the weaknesses we look at the strength and the result of when people take advantage of their strength is that it increases productivity it dramatically improve, engage, improves engagement and motivation it even increases the quality of life of people because they're really proud of doing what they do and happy to do it because it's a, they're exploiting their strengths. And interestingly enough, when you do this with teams, um, it improves the productivity of the team when everybody knows what are the strengths of every member of the team. It improves the profitability in a private sector environment and it reduces staff turnover. So I'm not teaching this stuff, but I recommend it. I know somebody who, who, who helps teams do it. Uh, her name is Patricia uh, Torres. Uh, she's based in Geneva, very skilled at doing that. Um, but I really like what she's doing because it helps people. It generates energy. Uh, I've been using this approach in several of my training programs, and I see the results really very impressive. So I have tried to capture uh, in a few, the few minutes I had uh, some key elements. Uh, there's a lot more to say about the topic. Um, for those of you who want to know more, uh, there is my book, okay, uh, but it's in French. I apologize, it's not yet in English. And uh, there is also training. Uh, so one minute of advertising. University of Geneva has a CAS in responsible leadership. There's training at Fédération des entreprises romandes. Um, and there are other programs that I could not list them all here. But if anybody is interested, I put an easy, you can just contact me. Uh, I'll give you uh, some pointers. Uh, and I have here an easy to remember address on top of my other ma mailing addresses. So it's supercohen at supercohen.com. Anybody who cannot remember this mailing email address does not deserve to, to write me. 
Now, maybe some of you want to download this presentation. I'm giving you a link uh, that allows you to download it. And um, the organizers will, I think, anyway, give you the link to uh, download this presentation, the PowerPoint, uh, or uh, also uh, access the recording if you want to share this with um, other people. So I think I'm almost on time. Uh, now the floor is yours, questions, uh, maybe answers. Um, the download link is here again. You have my email address also. And uh, you can ask any question. There is no taboo question. Um, the only thing you have to know is that I will answer um, without being politically correct and I will truly tell you what I think. So don't be afraid. No, there's no bad questions. So the floor is yours and I'll stop sharing so I can see you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Raphael. And thank you all for, for taking the time to be with us. We know it was a very, it's a very quick presentation because of, of the time restrictions. So we hope that also that it was still a, still able to be enlightening for you, especially the idea of uh, the engaged team charters, which I, I found very interesting, but also the integrated approach to be able to, to look at it. We do have a lot of comments coming in by the chat, and I see that some of our uh, participants are answering uh, to each other as well, which is great. Um, thank you for that. But if you would like to ask a question, please do raise your hand. We, do, we have two question, uh, two people already raising their hands. Let's take a look at who's raised their hands here. Okay, uh, I believe it's Jean-Christophe Barth. Is that, is that you, Jean-Christophe? Would you like to ask the first question? There we go. I've, I've used um, the team charter in, in, in different contexts and I've made very good experiences in the past. Uh, I, I very much like the breakdown in the six uh, step rocket model. That was something new for me. And today I've moved to something I call the MOOC. A memorandum of understanding and process, especially when you set up a new organization, because it, even though I find the power of a, of a team charter extremely interesting, it creates that psychological contract. Um, I was wondering, um, at, at the beginning of a venture, it's so important to align people with their ambitions and all these things. And so I'm involved in early stage governance and, and, uh, and, Sometimes the team charter is helpful, but it's maybe not always able to, to grasp uh, the, the full uh, ambition of the team. So uh, I was, my question is, uh, do you have other tools that help to fine tune this team charter perspective? Well, my recommendation when you want to do a team charter is to use an external facilitator mm -hmm. because it's extremely difficult for the team to anticipate situations. Uh, they usually focus on what they know immediately and then the issues at stake, but they, they don't think beyond that. And let me give you a, an example where a facilitator can help. Um, let's say that you have a situation, I'm talking private sector now because it's this, for this example. Um, let's say that uh, you have to reduce um, the number of employees because of uh, COVID-19, yeah, okay? Simple situation. It's a fact of life, nobody likes it, but that's a fact of life. The question is how will you handle this situation? How, who will go and who will stay? If you have discussed this before, it's like a prenuptial agreement. You discuss in your prenuptial agreement, um, how are you going to be separated in the, the marriage? But you do it at a time when there's no stake, when you still love each other. But no team will think of addressing this kind of issue. And that's where the facilitator will suggest some issues and say, okay, guys, you have addressed those things, uh, not to be late in meetings, etc. But let's talk about something like uh, how should we handle this kind of thing? And interestingly enough, you will see that people have very different views on how to deal with staff reduction. But once you have agreed in advance of a mechanism of how to do it, life is a lot easier down the road. So uh, you're, you're right, uh, making a good team charter is difficult and I recommend to have facilitators. Now, you cannot use 
external facilitators all the time. My recommendation is that organizations should have in-house people who are trained to do it so that it doesn't cost a fortune. Uh, so that, that would be my, my, my take on this one. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Nicole Maguire. Hi, Nicole. Thanks for joining us. Over to you. I'm, I've, I'm going to um, unmute you now. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just thank you very much for this. I thought it was really interesting. And I was thinking that one of the reasons why I wanted to attend this was I was interested in the levers in the public sector in particular because it's, you know, I think a lot of us have read a lot of articles uh, about things that can be done and then sometimes you think well we can't do that because we don't have any money for bonuses or whatever and i was interested in your experience with the french post um, and what do you see that difference between the public or private sector or do you think to some extent it's a false dichotomy I personally think it's a false dichotomy. I spend a lot of time in hospitals and I can tell you if there's one place where there's no money, it's hospitals. Uh, and uh, for instance, uh, I'm in charge of uh, executive education at the Chuve uh, um, Hospital in uh, Canton de Vaud. This is a, it's, it's, it's totally public sector because it belongs to the Canton de Vaud state. It's not even an independent hospital like Geneva. And we're implementing all the stuff I'm talking to you about here. And it's perfectly fine. When people are aware of the rules of the game, you don't need bonuses. And I, I, I've been 27 years on the board of a director of a bank, and I'm very familiar with the banking system. Mm -hmm. Banking system has a lot of money and they give bonuses. I can tell you the, the, the spirit, the level of engagement is much lower despite the bonuses than it is in other places where there is no money. So money is not the key, the key criteria. What people want in terms of remuneration is a very simple thing. They want that it's fair. So the question is, what does fair mean? And I'll give you my take on this one. They want to make sure that they're paid according to what they're worth on the market. So they're comparing their remuneration with the one they could get somewhere else. And the second thing they check, and these are the only two things based on my experience as a manager, entrepreneur, etc. The other thing they're checking is, is my colleague being paid similarly as me for the similar work? So they just want fairness with their colleagues and the market. That's all. So okay. I, maybe somebody does not agree, but uh, I think that so, so to answer your question, private sector, public sector, the stakes are very similar. The tools may not be similar because in the public sector, you may not be able to fire people, but there are other ways of dealing with it. And uh, I've been exposed to that for more than 15 years. And I, I'm totally convinced that it's not the end of the world. Thank you. Nicole, is, is, is there anything else you wanted to ask or? No, I'm good. No? Thank you. That answered okay. my question. Thank you. No. Thank you, Nicole. Great. Um, we have also, Nivert, are you there? You also have raised your hand. Uh, no? Okay. Um, over to Bruno Donat. Are you there, Bruno? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, that was very engaging. And I, I, I think I don't have to agree or disagree, but I agree with, with everything. There's the openness, the sense of humor, and I think I I learned, and it's like almost like a refresher. I've been 20 plus years in the public sector and private, just moved to Geneva, last 20 years, UN field, just came to Geneva. Now, I came here because of this paradigm shift, and I'm learning from you. At this particular moment, and I'm linking it to the issue of fairness, there's a beginning of a conversation in the UN on racism. So different people would interpret it in different ways. I think it was people got emboldened by what happened in the US and then participate. And then there's a lot of drama about, are you supposed to say or not to say? Now, level of engagement, according to me, 
is linked to that conversation on fairness, on injustices, on racism, even in the UN. What kind of miraculous advice can you give me, a middle manager, because everybody's trying to help, because nothing, not nothing will change overnight. What is it that you think could get colleagues above me, under me, lateral, still remain engaged with very unpleasant conversations because some people might lose as we go, a very difficult conversations we are having. Anyways, I'm not sure what I'm saying. I asked you for your advice because you were brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure I understood the question. You would like to know what should be done so that these conversations don't take place or that... Uh, no, that they do take place. And okay. what is your guidance? Because okay. at the end of the day, we want people to work together, better performance. Was it the green or the red? The green, whatever. So uh, what is your advice to engage in that uncomfortable area, which is, I think, more and more apparent and people are talking about it. It's not that it wasn't there, but now people in teams are starting to talk about it. Thank you. Okay. Um, let, let me put it that way. I think that this conversation should never have to take place because there should be no racism. So we should not even have to discuss it. Okay. Now, could I be engaged if I know that my boss is racist or discriminating people? The answer is automatically no. Do you agree with that? Yes, no, I, or no? I think no. So do you think Just, I, I can be engaged if my boss is a racist? I think I misunderstood your question. I think I would, I, I would try to find ways to a solution with the racist boss if they exist. Okay. Would you? Would I? Rec would I recommend anybody to join that boss to work for that boss, knowing that this person is a racist? No. No. Okay. The answer is no. So, in other words, the level. Of, this is a way of measuring engagement. Okay. If you tell people, "Don't come here," <laughs> it means you're not engaged. So, by measuring engagement, you actually measure the end result. So, if your boss wants to be followed and have engaged people, the boss cannot be racist. So racism is a component. Fairness is a component. Um, there are many behaviors that will determine the end result. So my point of view on this is that if you measure the level of engagement, you know whether the manager has followers or not. And the manager will have to do the right things to have followers. So if you just measure engagement, you check whether they're doing the right thing. And it will be their duty to do the right thing. So that's why I insist so much on measuring the level of engagement. Because the level of engagement is not a diagnosis on how people do things, whether they're racist or not, whether they're fair or not, whether they're um, uh, competent or not. No, I just measure the end result. And then I tell them, if their score is not good enough, I say, you've got to do something about it. And if you want to know what is leading to this low level of engagement, it's your job. HR will help you find out. And if it's a racism issue, it's your problem. I want engagement. So instead of focusing on the how, I want people to focus on the end result. And it's not the, and that's why I'm saying, uh, if everybody is engaged, I can guarantee you there is no discrimination. Nobody will be engaged if there is discrimination. So I don't know if I answered your question. You give an answer. And okay. I can thank you for the. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for asking Bruno and also for, for the critical question. Thank you. We actually do have Nivert on the line and she wanted to ask you a question as well. Nivert, over to you. Professor Guy, just I'm not a young man. I'm a 
the young women, but uh, I will talk about um, on behalf of the young people. And what is your advice for them to, to enter in this uh, world of sharks when there is good managers, bad managers, and how when they to integrate well in a team and in our organization or the private sector? How to integrate, sorry, what? Well, in, in this uh, difficult times and this difficult world of good manager, bad managers, and yeah, all the problems that we, we are facing now with all the experience we have, those, these young people do not have enough experience to try and, yeah, enough no. experience. So what is your advice for them? Okay, first thing, everybody cannot work with everybody. I mean, there are some people who are compatible with others and other, and I'm not compatible with everybody. Now, why should I work with people with whom I'm not compatible, okay? So if, if, if somebody is totally in a power game, I'm not going to be compatible with that person, okay? Now, the advice I give to my children and to all my friends' children because is don't choose a job, choose a boss. You can have a wonderful position, a wonderful job with a bad boss, you're going to suffer dramatically. You can have a lousy job with a fantastic manager and you're going to enjoy it. So it's not the job, it's the manager. So my advice to any young person is to try to find out to the extent you can what is the managerial style of your future boss and to take this into account in your analysis. Because uh, if you go in a place where the, you're not compatible with your boss, you don't have the same values, etc., I can sign that you're going to, to, to suffer. Uh, I've seen people working in a bank, to give you an example, they were working in a basement, no window, uh, counting banknotes, okay? This is the job. And they were working there for 15 years, perfectly happy to work there because they love their, their manager. I've seen people at the hospital taking care of uh, garbage. They're garbage cleaners, okay? They're, they're responsible of disposal of garbage and they love it. Okay, they love it. Okay, I'm not overdoing it, but they, they are happy. They, they, they don't complain and they stay for years. They could go and find something else, but it's the person that makes the difference. And that's why I insist so much on agreeing on the rules together, because if you agree on the rule together, on the rules together, you, it means you, you are aligned. It, this is a world that you understand. The rules are clear. Um, the, the, the fundamental principles, the values are, are yours because you've been part of it. And if you don't agree, why do you stay? <laughs> okay, it, it could be for money uh, because you have to make money. But uh, my advice is never stay in an environment that does not correspond to your values because it will destroy you little by little. So I don't know if that answer is your question, but I think it's important. Great. Thanks, Steven. Thanks for, for your answer, Rafael. If anyone else has a question, we still have about five minutes left, so please don't hesitate to raise your hand. I've been following a bit of the chat also, Rafael, during your presentation, and there were a few responses to the engaged team charter. Some people were asking, how do we do we bring about goodwill among all team members to, to, to look at this charter and to implement the charter? Um, there are a few questions also around, will it drive competition between team members? And also um, uh, a response by a colleague called Danny, actually maybe it's not competition that it drives, it's actually uh, motivating yourself individually to do better than what you were doing before. Um, any responses to, to these insights? Um, yeah, well, let's start with the, the last point. I've never seen competition uh, happening because of the team charter. On the contrary, it reduces competition because people understand and agree that they're not in competition. Uh, by agreeing on how uh, people are promoted or not promoted on the principles that would govern their uh, interaction, uh, there is much less competition. You know, in a team, there are a lot of situations, there are lots of situations where people assume things and they, they don't truly uh, know what is going on, they go with their assumptions. So uh, by 
putting things on the table and discussing them, these assumptions disappear and it creates a, 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 a much more uh, peaceful environment. Uh, people feel much more secure. And if there is one thing that is essential in organizations is a secure base, is to know how things work. If you don't know the rules of the game, then it creates um, a feeling of lack of safety. So uh, the, 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 the team charter is precisely, precisely helping people uh, be involved or uh, leading people to be part of the decision-making process of what, how their life will be governed. Now, if somebody does not agree with that, why would you keep that person in that team? Excuse me, Mr. Cohen. Yes. Uh, uh, when I, I'm Danny, <laughs> and uh, when I wrote that, I wasn't really addressing the team charter. I, maybe I misunderstood. Apologies, Danny. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe I misunderstood. What, what I was uh, thinking of um, was the program that you were saying people can take part in uh, to, to get input over a period of two years. I understood that what they would have would be a confidential note from two years ago, from last year and from this year, and they could see themselves progressing, whereas other people couldn't. So that's why I was saying there really wasn't competition except between you and your future you. Is that, what, is that how that works? Absolutely, absolutely. Because uh, when your score is published, let's say after two years, um, you have to face the music because people will know <laughs> and you cannot uh, anymore uh, pretend that you're a good manager if your score is low. So it's your decision to do something about it uh, or not. And I can tell you uh, what has happened because we've done it. <laughs> and uh, if you're interested, I can explain the, what we have observed. Um, we each, as I said, each manager has received his, her score plus the average of the rest of the team. And there has been three situations. The people who uh, were, uh, who have received a higher or equal score than the average, they got an incredible boost because there's nothing more rewarding for a manager than to know that people that you're managing want you as a manager. Uh, they, they really were very happy and it gave them, it energized them. Then there were two other groups that had scores below. First one, the large majority said, wow, I'm not so happy with this score. What can I do? So why I know what I'm describing is because the person who, uh, there was a coach, external coach, giving the score to each manager. We wanted to make sure that they uh, would not be under shock when they received an email with their score. So I've asked that uh, coach, external coach, to give me a summary. And the, the coach said there are three situations. First one is those who had the higher score than the average. Second one is those who were below. And their reaction was, uh, what can I do and to, to improve it? So they, we created a true desire of self-improvement and we channel these people to HR and said ask HR what they can offer coaching training um, uh, mentoring 360 if you want to understand why you're not doing so well there are things that can be done to to help you and then there was a, there was a third group that nobody expected and the third group were below the average also, and their answer was, oh, I'm not surprised. So what do you mean you're not surprised? Yeah, yeah, I'm not surprised because in any case, I don't enjoy managing people. I was appointed because I was a, a, a good salesperson and now I'm a head of sales. But I, what I like is to sell. It's not to manage people. But how could I say no? More money, more status, more a bigger office more 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 of course i took the job but this is not my thing so these people are not obtaining engagement for sure it means that the organization is losing so it's a an obvious casting mistake 
um, now the organization at one point has to decide whether it wants to keep its head into the, uh, the sand or if uh, it wants to do something about those casting mistakes. So I think the measurement of engagement is, is really a very, very effective tool to force people to take, to be responsible, take charge of their own uh, professional life. Did I answer your question or was I off, uh, offline? No, no, you answered the question directly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Danny, for joining in there. Great, thank you, Raphael. I don't see more questions coming in via the raise hand, but in any event, I'm afraid we're actually out of time. So thank you, thank you, Raphael, Professor Cohen, thank you so much for joining us today for really just touching the surface of, of a wider issue. Um, so we hope though that for our audience, thanks for sticking in there for this night class, that it, it brought you some new information at least to ponder and, and to consider some new ideas, hopefully. I know for me also having worked at the UN now for eight years, that these are some definitely some new ideas for me. And I think this is important to, to remember that we should always be open to, to new ideas as you, as you required. So thank you so much. I also want to thank the production team behind the scenes who are here. Um, you all know who you are. Thank you so much uh, for, for being here and for making sure this could all happen. I wanted to briefly share with you um, how we, you can find out more information about the session because we did record it. So I'm just going to show you now uh, our website. So commons.ungeneva.org is where you're going to find the recording tomorrow. Our, our, colleague, uh, our colleagues are going to, to make sure that it's up for you tomorrow in case you would like to, to rewatch or to look more at the charter. Um, we will also make sure that we, we have your email addresses and we can send you that recording as well if that would be more helpful for you. Um, we do appreciate all feedback, all feedback, positive, negative, critical, positive, um, uh, constructive criticism, we really do appreciate. So if you want to scan the QR code with your phone, uh, we, we do take all feedback. So thank you for that. Great, um, finally, there is one thing. Um, Raphael, thank you for joining us. Um, is there any final words that you would like to share with, with our attendees? Uh, yes, first I would like to thank you for inviting me and uh, for all of you for uh, listening. Uh, I think, um, I hope that you will all become ambassadors of a, for, for a better work environment and that you will fight for some of the principles I have uh, been presenting. I, um, I would be very happy to get some feedback. So if you have two words to say in the chat, please uh, do so, uh, whether this was relevant for you or, or not. And, um, uh, as I said, if anybody wants to contact me uh, with pleasure, I'll be more than happy. I'm passionate about what I'm doing and uh, I'm very, very happy to engage with uh, anybody who would like to, to push this kind of, uh, of concepts, messages and uh, approaches. So I wish you a lot of pleasure, a lot of gratification in uh, your professional life. Uh, and I hope that this was uh, somehow um, thought stimulating. So thank you very much. Thank Bye. you, Raphael. That's fantastic. Great. Okay, a quick reminder, if anyone would like to know more about leadership, we do have conversations on different forms of ideas of leadership on our on our podcast at the library, for if it's new for anybody. So at our, at our podcast, which is called The Next Page, we have different conversations with practitioners and experts. And I've put a few on the screen of different, um, different interviewees who brought a different perspective on leadership. So if you'd like to, to, to take the time to listen to those, you're more than welcome to. You'll find it um, on, on Spotify and Apple Podcasts podcast or you can you can scan the QR code there but that's all thank you very much for joining us we wish you a great summer as well hopefully you get a break um, because it has been a, a very very uh, different four or five months for everybody so we hope that you will be able to reflect and also come back from your break uh, ready for all the work we still have to do together so thank you so much for taking the time and we wish you a great evening and a great summer bye for now thank you Natalie bye bye